Hello, and welcome to Miami-Dade County Public Schools STEAM Studios. Happy Earth Day! Carlos de la Camara from the Department of Science. And this is our special broadcast for Earth Day 2021. In today's news, we'll explore South Florida and learn how you can do your part on Earth Day and every day. We'll take you in a visit to the Biscayne Nature Center for Environmental Education and learn about endangered animals. We'll meet with scientists who have made a positive impact to the local mangrove ecosystem. And we will go on an excursion with an ethnobotanist from the Nature Center where we will learn about mitigating the impacts of climate change. Let's go live now on site at the Biscayne Nature Center for Environmental Education in Key Biscayne. We'll be back after this message from the Biscayne Nature Center for Environmental Education. Good day, teachers, and welcome to the Biscayne Nature Center for Environmental Education virtual experience. Here is how to register. Now, Ms. Morin will start off the program displaying an interactive video. This video covers photosynthesis, plant adaptations, and some fun facts about the uses of the plants demonstrated. Next, Ms. Agus Vives discusses transfers of energy. We know it best as food webs. She will ask a series of questions that engages students and gives them a clear understanding of interdependence. In closing, Dr. Z will demonstrate some of the marine organisms we find on the seagrass beds right behind the nature center. He will discuss adaptations and interesting factoids that will have students bombarding him with questions. Reporting live from the Biscayne Nature Center, Miami-Dade County's premier nature center by the sea, I am Adela Aigues Vives, one of three teachers at the Nature Center. April 22nd, 2021 marks 51 years that we celebrate Earth Day. The reason we celebrate Earth Day is to raise awareness about protecting the Earth, all forms of life that live here, and their environments. We also discuss how climate change and global warming negatively impact the balance and biodiversity within these ecosystems. This year's theme, Restoring Our Earth, focuses on natural processes, green technologies, and new ideas that restore our ecosystems and bring them back. What is the negative impact of climate change and global warming on Earth's ecosystems? Well, according to a recent study, the sixth mass extinction is happening right now and it's entirely our fault. The last mass extinction occurred 66 million years ago when the dinosaurs disappeared. Humans have wiped out hundreds of species through wildlife trade, pollution, habitat loss, use of toxic substances, and overfishing. On the local level, we have a few endangered species of our own, such as the Florida panther. It survives only in a tiny area of South Florida. It's listed as endangered since 1967 due to habitat destruction. Large numbers of panthers have died due to expansion of roads. And as of 2011, only 100 to 120 are left. Did you know that it can leap more than 15 feet and run up to 35 miles per hour and it can live up to 12 years? One of the species that are endangered in Florida is our loggerhead turtle. Our loggerhead turtle uh, was threatened in 1978, basically because of habitat destruction. Their habitats are basically the beaches where they lay their nests and also over harvesting of eggs and death due to bycatch. Bycatch refers to when fishermen throw out their nets to catch fish and instead they also catch other animals like turtles. 95% of loggerheads nest in Florida, and due to careful management, populations increased by 24%, but now their numbers have declined again. They are considered vulnerable since 2015. 
Because of global warming, increasing temperatures means that more loggerhead females can be born. What happens is, under normal conditions, when females lay their eggs, they dig a hole, and as she digs, the eggs towards the top that are closer to the sun will turn out to be females. The eggs towards the bottom, which are cooler, will turn out to be males. My little guys. I like to remember this as hot chicks, cool dudes. But unfortunately, because of global warming, all the eggs in the nest could turn out to be females. And this would be a huge problem for the reproductive success of these turtles. Did you know that a female loggerhead may travel thousands of miles to nest on the same beach it was born in? Another species of turtle that is endangered is the leatherback, although now the status is vulnerable. Again, climate change, sea level rise, and stronger storms that erode and destroy their beach habitats. Warming oceans, will also introduce new predators that harm the coral reefs that they need to live in. In a recent report, another one of our endangered species, the Florida manatee, scientists found 432 dead manatees in the Florida waters. Half of the dead manatees were found in the Indian River Lagoon. The lack of seagrass is what's cutting off the manatee's food supply. Also, the lagoon has been plagued by nutrient overload and algal blooms. Go. So where do these nutrient overload comes from? It comes from farming and from over-fertilized lawns that cause algal blooms, which in turn kill the seagrass, which is the main source of food for these manatees. Overfishing parrot fish in the Caribbean is having a huge negative impact on coral reefs. Climate change has already doomed them, but the loss of parrot fishes and other grazers have been far more important than climate change for Caribbean reef destruction. Even though climate change poses an enormous risk for the future because of coral bleaching and more acidic oceans, reefs protected from overfishing, coastal development, and pollution are much more resilient to these stresses. Protection of parrotfish and other herbivores from fishing are an important way to help restore these. Reefs where parrotfish are not protected, they have suffered declines, not just by overfishing, but also by overuse for recreation, excessive and destructive coastal development, and pollution. Well, what steps are we taking to restore and bring these endangered species back. So what are some of the species that we have brought back successfully? Well, there's the American alligator, the American falcon, the bald eagle, and the brown pelican. How has this happened? It's happened through our own personal ownership of the problem, laws that have been enacted into place, and increased awareness of the environment. Here are some ways we can restore endangered species and help recover endangered and threatened species. You can learn about endangered and threatened species in your area and the threats they face. You can watch wildlife responsibly. You can volunteer for restoration projects and take other actions to protect habitats. You can report marine mammals or sea turtles in distress. In short, it is up to each and every one of us to restore our earth, not just because we care about the natural world, but because we live on it. We all need a healthy earth to support our jobs, our livelihoods, our health, our survival, and our happiness. A healthy planet is not an option. It is a necessity. Thank you, Thank Andela. You. That was fascinating. Now, Dr. Z will take you over the dunes and under the waves to see how you can do your part in restoring the coastline. And they couldn't see the ocean from their rooms, you know, from their houses or whatever. So they took down all the dunes. All the dunes were ripped out. 
and then whenever there was major for uh storms or anything with storm surges there was constant flooding on Key Biscayne and so we're doing a lot of dune restoration projects here on Key Biscayne and this is one of the restoration projects that we're done and this one's got a very it's got a particular soft spot for our Dade County Schools because a Dade County teacher participated greatly with this restoration project right here this dude teacher's name was David Negrelli he is he just retired last last year and he would bring students out here throughout the year to help with this restoration project so this dude starting over there and going to two lifeguard stations down there this is one of the restored dunes and the dune system is extremely important because it provides shoreline protection from storm surge, from winds, etc. Uh, in 2017, when Hurricane Irma came through, the storm surge here on Key Biscayne was 11 feet. And 11 feet is, see where the number one is on the lifeguard station? That's how high the water came. Uh, if you remember in South Miami, Coconut Grove, uh, downtown Miami completely flooded. There are boats on A1 on the streets on US1, A1A. Here we didn't have any flooding on Key Biscayne, very minimal flooding because these dunes acted as a buffer towards the hurricane, you know, the storm surge and the wind. So we had flooding, but mostly from rainwater and some saltwater intrusion. But most of the water was stopped because the, you know, our dune goes up you know eight or nine feet and it just stopped all the storm surge and so this dune all these dunes that you see all the way down to Key Biscayne to Bill Baggs Park a lot of hello my name is Dr. Julian Mark Zaragoza I am a marine bio biologist researcher and educator I am one of the teachers here at the Biscayne Nature Center for Public Schools and in in the summer, I'm a professor, adjunct professor at Florida Atlantic University. So we're walking towards the different seagrass meadow areas, and the Biscayne Nature Center has been doing project programs here for the past few years. One of the, you know, years, one of the activities that we do is the seagrass adventure where the kids go out in the water with nets and they catch little the animals, and then we do about the animal and kids will remember that forever. So first I'm gonna show you we're gonna look at two different areas of seagrass. One that in good condition and one that is in bad condition. And then talk about what can we do to restore this area. Here we're in an area of the seagrass where it's relatively healthy, very pretty shallow water you can see. It's about waist deep. And um, this area over here is, has for the last one of let's put it this way, one of the advantages of the pandemic is that we have had a lot less people here. Two main types of seagrass that we have. We have this one which we call turtle grass. This one right here, this flat one. And the turtle grass or Thalassia testudinum, and then we have manatee grass. It's a round, thin manatee grass, Syringodium filiformi. And these are the two main species that we have here. Okay, so this area has, is very important for many different reasons to see grass here. One, it's a food source for the manatees, and also it's a nursery area for a lot of juvenile animals. For example, uh, all kinds of reef fish.
So, <clears throat> here we are in an area of the seagrass where there's extensive damage. And you can see when I was swimming around, there are a lot of sand patches in between. And the one predominant seagrass that we find here is this one right here. It looks a lot like the manatee grass, but this is into one of the seagrasses that look like a little orange, I mean a little green bush. And that is called penicillus or merman's shaving brush. And then I showed you one also that had a little cup that looked like a little cup. And that's acetabularia crinulata and or mermaid's wine glass. And that acetabularia crinulata is a single celled organism. It's a plant that is one single cell. This is the third type of seagrass that we find. And this is called shoalgrass, Halodulli ridei. And these are a lot like the manatee grass, but they're flat bladed. And these species are usually found in areas that are high impact, where there's a lot of current, or when it's an area that has been damaged. These are very, very resistant because since they're so flat, they don't present, you know, they turn. They're, when they get hit by the currents, they don't uproot as easily because they're flat. So you find those uh, areas like this one over here, which has been damaged. Now, this area has been damaged you know, by people, number one. Number two, <clears throat> during the and phosphates, and that leads to these huge algal blooms. And also, all that extra food, the nitrates and the phosphates in the water, become a good food source for algae like this one, brown algae. This is <clears throat> sargassum. Now this sargassum, during the summer we have a lot of these these blooms over here and they, uh, over the last uh, four years or so, we have had in massive, massive amounts of sargassum that come into this area. You know, all throughout the Caribbean and South and, uh, and Florida. And here particularly, since there is a, that sand bank over there, a lot of the sargassum that comes into this area gets bottled up and gets stays here. So during the summer, you can imagine a huge mat of this stuff just floating on the surface. And it covers, whew, as far as we can see, you know, a couple hundred yards that way. The problem is, is that these guys are blocking the sun, basically. So it creates like a blanket on the surface. So there's no light penetration that comes through. And since there's no light penetration, the seagrass that's underneath dies off because it cannot, you know, produce its own food. It cannot photosynthesize. No primary production is going on. Therefore, it collapses the trophic pyramid. Okay, so you have a bottom-up uh, trophic cascade of destruction. You have seagrasses that are dying out, herbivores die out, etc., etc. Now, earlier we saw <clears throat> that aplysia. That aplysia is a sea slug. And these are the kind of algae that they re, that they eat. This is a red algae, Rhodophyta, and this is where they get that coloration. The pigments from the algae gives the aplysia that particular color. Okay, and so there's many different plans on restoring these areas over here. The first is education you have to tell you know have to educate the public on the importance of these seagrass beds number one the food for the manatees they're a nursery for all these different fish and remember a lot of the fish that are here move off to the reef or in deeper waters and those become the basis of the fishery industry down here fishing here is a huge multi multi-million dollar industry and some of the smaller fish that we catch offshore hatch here in the seagrass so if we teach you know people about the importance of keeping the fisheries which sustains you know tourism dollars and at the same time you're restoring an area preserving the fish conserving the populations of the fishery station so people learn stay away from the seagrass don't walk in the seagrass don't anchor your boats in the seagrass and don't throw garbage in the seagrass all these different things that the public can do the restoration technique that we have that is less invasive that's very simple to use is to actually put perching poles that's how they call them and it's putting poles in the seagrass straight up with a crossbar on the top and allowing birds to rest on these on these perching poles so they when they come into this area 
you know, and they've been feeding in the seagrass, just like the pelican right behind us that just dive bombed us right here. So a lot of these guys, if we have the pelican's gonna hang out there, he's gonna eat his food, he's gonna digest it, he's gonna poop out. So the food, everything that he poops out becomes natural fertilizer for this area. So it's using some it's something that's already in the wild as you know a helper for the restoration of the seagrasses in this area. So if everybody does a little bit to help, you know, all these projects, we can restore the seagrasses here. And that's the big theme for this year's Earth Day. Restore our Earth. Thank you, Dr. Z. My head is swimming with ideas of how I can do my part in restoring our Earth right here in Miami. In our next segment, we'll meet with local educator and ethnobotanist Catherine Morin, live from Crandon Park. For many years, we have leaned towards saving our planet by mitigating or adapting to the impacts of climate change. Scientists have come together looking at green technologies to restore the world's ecosystems and wildlife, rebuild soils, and get rid of ocean's plastics. We don't need to wait for mitigation. We just need to understand natural processes, such as reforestation and soil conservation. These practices allow the soil to absorb significant amounts of carbon, successfully inviting biodiversity. We are reaching of what seems almost the point of no return, where the only way to a drawdown of greenhouse gases is to restore our Earth which is our theme for this year's Earth Day 2021. Welcome all, my name is Katerina Morin and I am an environmental scientist that has been working in the field as an educator for over 20 years. I am here to discuss with you how climate change has affected our ecosystems, what steps are being taken and actions we can implement as individuals in our small spaces on this planet. Our Earth is experiencing record amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere at around 417 parts per million. Whereas prior to the Industrial Revolution, we were at 288. What does this mean for you? Well, if we continue business as usual, we are looking at a temperature increase of two to five degrees Celsius. Now, let me show you what that looks like. At the height of the pandemic, Earth observing satellites had detected a significant decrease in the concentration of greenhouse gases at about 70% due to the temporary shutdown mostly caused by the destructive emissions that enter the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, synthetic fertilizer use, and livestock production. So we now know if we take action in restoring the earth, we will see notable reductions. Side note, we are experiencing another issue, non-renewable masks, wipes, and gloves. Producing these materials are creating more greenhouse gas emissions. Then after limited use, these products sit in landfills for years to come and they are often not even disposed of properly, ending up as debris in our environment. We need to consider the materials we consume. Chew on that for a moment. So let's discuss some examples we can do to restore our Earth. Here at the Nature Center, we have a unique combination of ecosystems. So one of the most important actions we take here is simply keeping the leaf litter on the ground or trees that have been pruned remain. Why do we do this? because decomposing leaf litter releases nutrients into the soil and keeps it moist. It also serves as nesting material and shelter for many organisms. This dead organic stuff provides a perfect habitat for a slew of organisms, such as worms, snails, spiders, snakes, lizards, and of course, we can't leave out the little things. It's microbe heaven in here. Take a look at this. Come, come closer, closer, closer. Closer. Now we're getting to the good stuff. Yep. Soil is a carbon sequester. Not just any soil, but rich, aerated, microfilled soil. As these plants photosynthesize, they are taking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the leaves. Carbon is then pumped down through the roots and feeds the microorganisms in the soil. Essentially, the soil is a carbon sink. We are in an expanse of asphalt with small tree islands that need major retrofitting. These islands are here for storm water infiltration and retention. However, they are not quite doing their job. I've been out here following a downpour and found myself standing in a pool of water. What can we do to improve these islands? Mm, I don't know. Hmm. Oh, I know. If 
if I construct a parabola with a mild slope and incorporate more vegetation, these islands will prevent flooding by absorbing water runoff, reduce heat, and store carbon. Boom. Here we are on a monocultured grass yard. Now, no more rhetorical questions. What can we do here to take part in restoring our earth? I'd like to hear some examples. And to test what you have learned so far, what will be the benefits? I think really hard at how to use my space more wisely in my backyard. I think uh, I have to get my hands dirty <laughs> and do some gardening this weekend. Now let's go back and meet up with Dr. Z again and learn about a very successful restoration program, Bill Bag's Cape Florida State Park, as my family calls it, El Fari. Mangrove restoration site and a little bit of history. Back in 1992, Hurricane Andrew hit this place and, you know, came through South Florida and it was one of the, ecologically speaking, it was one of the best things that happened down here for Key Biscayne. On this island, Key Biscayne, it was a complete monoculture. That means that almost all the trees were Australian pines. Australian pines that are 50 or 100 feet high. And anybody that lived that used to come here in, in the 90, 80s and 90s will remember that there was a forest of pine trees. And those were exotic and invasive species. But when Hurricane Andrew came in 1992, it knocked down 95% of all the you know, Australian pines that were here on Key Biscayne. So it became you know, a great uh, time to do a restoration project. There was a lot of cleaning up to do first. You know, all of these thousands and thousands of truckloads of dead um, Australian pines were taken away and this area was basically flattened out and any Australian pines that were left were removed. So these right behind me there's an extensive set of canals that go in and out and uh, this area is just north of uh, No Name Harbor here we are here on so important because they provide shoreline protection uh, from erosion from um, water and wind mangroves mangroves are basically a giant buffer zone that stop the elements and so this Key Biscayne used to be completely filled with uh, mangroves and a lot of the mainland in South Florida also had a big huge area of mangroves and then during the years with um, <clears throat> With all the building and all this, a lot of the mangroves were taken out. Gary Milano and a lot of different departments, they started this huge restoration project. And here they basically concentrate on mangroves. A lot of monitoring of the mangroves. So what happened was, I can't remember exactly how many you know uh, acres were basically flattened out. And all these thousands and thousands and thousands of um, juvenile mangroves were planted. Red mangroves, white mangroves, black mangroves were planted depending on you know where, what zone they are closer to the water or further back. And we used to monitor the growth of you know the mangroves and see how well they were you know coming back the, the, the natural recruit and then we waited for natural recruitment of other plants that came in. So if you see around the ones with the big leaves, those are sea grape trees. Some of those sea grape trees are planted as part of the restoration project and others were naturally recruited. That means that birds or animals that had eaten the sea grapes would drop the seed somewhere and those plants would come up. First started working here with the University of Miami and the Dade County Public School Systems system. It was 1997 and back then the mangroves, you know, some of the propagule, I mean some of the seedlings were about this big and you can see I can't even get close to the canals anymore. So all this is, was part of a giant restoration. And that's all for today's newscast. Once again, I'm Carlos de la Camara. And from all of us at STEAM Studios, happy Earth Day.